Board games, board games, it's what I'm talking about. Board games, board games, I'm not gonna shout. And here over to this side of me is the person known as Rory. And very soon we will be hearing from Rory Muldoon. If I've pronounced that name correctly, if I haven't, Rory, tell me. We're going to be talking about how art feeds into mechanics. That's the other way that I normally think of this. Board games, board games, it's what I'm talking about. Board games, board games, we're not going to shout. Ooh. <laughs> hello, and hello, Xate, it is lovely to see you. And I am Bez. If you are in the U if you are in USA, it's kind of bedtime, I think, most places. Or maybe you're getting up really early. Or maybe you're in New Zealand or Australia where, you know, bedtime's just coming up. And so it is the busy bedtime board game letter. And with me, I am chatting today about developing arts alongside games with the wonderful Rory Muldoon. Hello. And it's a delight to have you with us. Um, I've playtested your game. Uh, when was it? It's like six months ago, something like that. I think it's longer than that. I think it was maybe the last time I did a play, a group play test was maybe a year, over a year ago, I think. Um, so yeah, quite a long time ago. But yeah, very useful feedback, and that helped a lot in the development. And yeah, it's at a good, a good place now. Yeah, and um, that was back in the days where he came over to Royal Festival Hall, where a bunch of people will know. Back in the days, we used to. Um, before pandemic we would um have meetings every friday from 10 ish until 4 30 ish and then we brought over this clever little worker placement a bidding -y sorts of game called scora and we're not just here to talk about scora we're also here to talk about the wider application of developing art and not just how game mechanics can feed into art, but how it can also go the other way. Do you think that's a fair analysis of what we're here to do today? Yeah, definitely. I think as me as a designer, I think that's how I approach um, approach things because it came from from art before, before game design. So that's sort of the way I do things when, when I start out on a project, which is, you know, as you say, some people do it the other way around. Um, and I think they're all routes are, uh, you know, every well, every route is viable. I mean, it feels to me like ideally you want it to be a big circle, like one feeds into the other, feeds into the first, and then it, until it's a tightly woven thing that you just can't tell where it started. Yeah. And hello, Alan. It's lovely to see you and all the best with knocking down your other wall, apparently. <laughs> so let's get stuck into our regular features and talk about brilliant thing brilliant thing what's the little thing which is brilliant um i think a brilliant thing is a body of water so i know water has been featured before um and it's great for drinking but i think it's also great for just being near especially at the moment mm. i think now you know we can go outside and that helps a lot with dealing with lots of different things and being by a body of water. I'm very, very, very lucky to be near the River Thames. And so just going Ooh. to stand by the water or walk by the water, I think is just great and definitely helpful for, for my mental health, just being near it. Can I ask you whereabouts you live exactly? I mean, you don't have to give us an exact streets address. Just uh, So I live in, in Maidenhead, which I, I guess in the board game world is most famous for being where Handycon, um, the the convention is is located uh, and it's west of london yeah wow so pretty far up the river thames yeah but it's still pretty big here so you can still enjoy it in in all its glory and i definitely I mean, do how thick would you say this river is in um, 
So where I am, it's maybe. You reckon you could swim across easily? Uh, not easily. I don't. <laughs> I don't think easily. I mean, maybe like thirty meters wide or something. Um, mm. Where I am. I mean, that's a guess, and I'm not very good with measurements. So, um, but yeah, certainly big enough that if you did try and swim it, you'd be tired when you got to the other side. What's I reckon you could do it? You look like a fit individual. Well, I did. I used to swim quite a lot, and then when everything closed down, I haven't haven't done for a while. But yeah, I mean, maybe if this hot weather keeps up, then that's <laughs> what I'll be doing. Because um, yeah, it's really really hot. Oh my gosh, it says, and I am um, sweating. I'm wondering. Oh, here I have um, a thing that I can use to dab my forehead. Thank goodness. And otherwise, I'd be dripping in a moment. Yeah. Um, now, yes, I love bodies of water and just having them around us. And we could get so much into them, like the rivers, the oceans, the waves, you know, just kind of the breeze that's coming around, like the seagulls that flock around large bodies of water. And, um, you no, know, Alan Outson says Maidenhead head is quite easy to get to from West London, so handy from Handycon. Yeah, and it is. Um, but we're not just here to talk about you know bodies of water, we're also here to talk about games, 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 games. What have we been playing? What are their names? Games. Um, I'll let you go first, Rory. Um, so I've been playing a, a little, a few games. So I live with my girlfriend who does play play games, but I also play a lot of solo games. And um, I've very much been enjoying um, the official solo expansion for Seven Wonders Jewel, which came out during the lockdown um, from um, Antoine Bowser and Bruno Cathala. Uh, and it's just a little deck of, of cards here, you can see. So... It's not, um, it wasn't a huge thing to, to make up. Um, and then some, some more cards here. And it's um, it's a, a cool... So can you show us the second bunch of yeah. cards again? So it's, um, I think these are the art the artwork that was from the Leaders expansion for Seven, mm. Seven Wonders. And it's been repurposed for, for the solo mode for Seven Wonders Duel. Um, and you effectively, each of those cards is a different... AI opponent that you can play against um, and they're sort of structured differently so Caesar is very aggressive from a military perspective and um, Aristotle is more science focused um, and it's just a nice little a nice little puzzle I think it's um you know I know solo gaming isn't for everyone but it's definitely something that I enjoy doing particularly um, when it's quite puzzly and just easy to do so you know there's an you're playing against an ai opponent but effectively that's just flipping a card and the card has some basic instructions about what the, the leader will take uh from the, the the tableau in front of you um and so you've got this back and forwards where you're trying to you know just stop the leader from amassing all the points or amassing a victory condition and at the same time trying to focus on your own little puzzle so yeah that's that's what i've been playing recently and I've been really enjoying it. It's like twenty. It's a twenty-minute game, um, and the solo mode, like I say, was a, a free, uh, a free expansion that was put out, and it's great. It's definitely worth checking out. That does sound lovely, and um, just wanting to quickly check out the few pictures of um, Seven Wonders Duel. Um, you can and um see that it has a big following here's a tournament going wow. on in can yeah so i'm not very good at the two player the actual game um but i enjoy the solo mode and i bought it primarily for the solo mode when i saw that um the the solo mode had been put out as a free print and play i um managed to get a relatively um cheap Copy, second-hand copy of Seven Wonders Jewel. Um, so yeah, I've been playing that and, and and enjoying it. And I do enjoy the the kind of the big multiplayer Seven Wonders too. Um, Seven Wonders Jewel is a bit more uh, it's a bit more confrontational because obviously it's just mm. two people, um, which I think some well, people. It's always the way, isn't like. it? Like as soon as you go down, for, well, let's say that free player can lead to bad feelings, and I know that. I talked about how Chris unfortunately kind of got locked out of Compounded when I clustered, sorry, clustered 
and when I played it with Chris and Nicole on Monday last week, you know, Chris played down and I played on one side of Chris, McCall played on the other side of Chris. And then Chris was being like, you know, locked in from both sides and it was very unfortunate. And so that's one thing that ha can happen if you've got a board where you're placing and you're doing that. But conversely, if it's a game where you're picking on people, let's look at a grit cloud, a typical worker placement board game. In a free player game, yes, you could, if two things are pretty similar to you, think about, okay, what's the thing that's going to mess with other people? But primarily, you want to give yourself the points. Whereas in yeah. two players, suddenly, um, if I do a move that gives me four points and is eh, for you, well, that's a terrible move compared to one that gives me zero points but costs you six. Yeah, so I, I don't tend to like um, overly confrontational stuff. But So uh, actually a two-player game that I do really enjoy is um, is Circle the Wagons, which is uh, like a um, an 18-card, um, I guess it's like a tableau builder-y kind of spatial um, puzzle. But what's nice about that is the, the, the player interaction between you and your opponent is entirely in the drafting. So it's got this kind of circular draft mechanic. And that, but the, the main scoring is how you you place the cards that you draft in front of you. So both you and your opponent are working on your own little spatial puzzle. Um, and so you can you can definitely hate draft. You can take cards the way that you think your opponent might need. But because there's so much to think about for your own your own little puzzle, then it doesn't tend to happen very often because you're more focused on yeah optimizing your own little uh, little thing in front of you rather than working out what your opponent's doing um so yeah i think that's a great that's a really good two-player game which is not you know it just doesn't feel aggressive it doesn't feel like you're kind of fighting each other and i think um you want to work out what exactly are you doing why are you playing this game what level of confrontation do you want because there is a lot of virtue in what is known as low interaction games there's even a lot of virtue in zero interaction games yeah. where a lot of the times people who join me on Tuesdays and Thursdays will know that in the evenings, 8 p.m. UK time, we often play Micro Muckle or 5 Mel or 3 Mel or other games. Well, 5 Mel, I guess there is some interaction because it's a race game. The first person to reach a certain point is, okay, the game's over now, that's the end. But um, up until that, so but it's questionable whether being able to trigger the end of a game for everyone involves interaction um but certainly something like free mail micro muckle where everyone's just got the same bunch of cards we know we're playing gets until the end there's nothing of oh wait if someone's won away then i should race and hurry up there's just okay i'm going to try and do the best and at the end um yeah you compare your score to other people there is some satisfaction of having played together in the same way that you feel nice about watching a movie together or going to the cinema together and sharing those moments. But the fact that you didn't beat down on other people can be an asset rather than a detriment. And talking yeah, about I... assets, I would like to talk about, um, sorry, I'm just putting my phone on airplane mode. I'd like to talk quickly about my experience of Cover Your Assets, which is a game I've had for a couple of years. Now, I got sent this for free by um, Fabrica Cart because they wanted to show me what their hot stamped foil looks like. And you can see it looks, you know, very shiny. Mm. I didn't get the hot stamped foil for WebBall Plus Plus. I only got the cold stamped foil. So it is kind of shiny, but it's not quite as shiny. But you know, there is a big expense difference. But you can sort of see the difference, right? Yeah. Anyway, so... Um, talking about... Um, yeah, cover your, the actual game is a game of basically you've got a bunch of cards in hand, only four, you make pairs, you put them down in front of you, and you're allowed to place cards if you've got something that matches a pair of someone else, let's say someone put down two stocks, you can say, hey, I've got a stock, so I get to steal your stock. But they can counter that by playing one of their own stocks. 
you could counter that by playing one of your own stocks and then the last person to not have one is the one who steals it and adds everything to it. So what this then means is that the pile becomes more and more impressive, it becomes more and more tense. There is a nice escalation of emotion and if, you know, there are also these wild cards, the gold and silver, and gold and silver not only are they worth a lot more, so putting having them in your set is going to give you lots of stuff, but you can use them to steal literally anything because they are wild cards. And so fundamentally, we went into the last round, the third round of the game. Um, Chris had 990,000, I had 600,000. The aim is to get a million. And so Chris only needed to get 10 points, which Chris managed, but I somehow managed to get 750 points. Uh, well, 750,000. Um, and it was partially because I played well and was beating down on Chris, which I'm like, yeah, I kind of feel slightly bad about it now. But also because of the way the luck turned out that's in that last game, I just got, I would say, I got at least six of the wild cards. Bearing in mind, there's 12 of them in the game, and this was a five-person game. That was just insanely lucky, and Chris never had the cards to defend themselves. And But at the same time, I felt like I'm wanting to win, and it's like, where do you draw the line between playing to win and saying, you know what, this other person's having a bad time, maybe lay off them a bit. Mm. Yeah, I think it's also um, when you, which is hard to do in a lot of games, but it's like winning winning in a way that's not like a complete runaway leader and then it's, or you, you know, you completely destroy the other person. I think I've seen that a lot in games where people, they're obviously going to win and they don't really take their foot off the gas. They just keep going and going and going, which I think can have a bit of a, you know, people can leave people feeling a bit annoyed that, that they've lost so badly um, because, you know, it's always it's important for be, a lot of people when they play games, how well they do. And um, yeah, I think it's, it's definitely an interesting social thing to try and read the table and to try and work out um, how to, to play. I mean, I don't think I've ever thrown a game by mm. because I wanted people to have a good time, but I think I've definitely... Um, taken moves which are not like the most optimal move because i want the other people to the other people playing to kind of take moves which they also which will also benefit them so you know like we were talking a bit earlier about like um when i was explaining circle the wagons you know you can definitely take a card that someone else will need but if you don't if that's not going to benefit you massively then don't why why do it it's it's sort of um I think particularly those games where there is low interaction or the like multiplayer solitaire style games, um, everyone is just doing their own puzzle. And it's quite nice to just have it as a shared experience where everyone is, feels like they're doing well or everyone feels like they're having a good time. Um, but yeah, it's a tricky one, especially when you have games with direct confrontation, because sometimes it's unavoidable. And then what do you do? You know, you, like I say, you don't really want to throw the game because that just spoils the whole the whole reason for playing, which is to you yeah. know, play a game. I mean, if I'd, like, if there's a card that allows you to steal from one person and no one else because that's the way the things match up, you know, at that point, it feels like it's almost disingenuous. Mm. Like, it feels um, like, I don't know, it's a weird one because that's what the game's almost there is no other good move i've only got four cards three of them are useless this one allows me to try and steal from chris and i don't know it's a difficult one i feel like we should um i've written down this topic because i feel like it's something that i would like to really delve into and explore a some points in the future mm. but moving away from i mean i'm not saying it's a bad game i played it we played three rounds. The first two rounds were actually quite fun because the luck of the draw was fairly reasonable. It is very much a luck-based game, I felt like, and working out the optimal thing to do. There is like lots of card-playing games. If you started counting your cards, then for sure you could eke out a couple more percentage points of winning. I'm not going to start counting cards. 
I just find that to be a really um, tiring and mm. unenjoyable thing to do. But um, I feel like Chris will, and I were probably both playing optimally by the end of it, but it just totally came down to the luck. And mm. early on, it was like, okay, we're having a bit of fun, we're joking, and when people steal stuff, and then it get becomes more and more valuable, and then someone steals it for, like, like maybe I steal it from Leila, McCall steals it from me, Chris steals it from McCall, and then it just goes around, and each time it's stolen, it becomes more and more valuable. So it's mm. like this high pressure thing, and eventually someone's like, ah, I managed to finish this game with this one thing that's worth like 300 points on its own. And, um, but there is something also to be said about the fragility of the game, but we're not just talking about that. We're also talking about life in general. Recent highlights, recent highlights, living life and seeing the sights, recent highlights. Um, I just want to share this is something that was made for me let me make myself bigger can you see this mm. it's a cross stitch that was given to me for my birthday celebration yesterday oh happy birthday thank you it's actually on thursday but you know because weekend celebrate even some people are still working so it still makes sense to celebrate birthdays on the weekends yeah, I think so. so um, but thank you very much, and um, that was a lovely thing. We had some, had a little cake with this in it, wow. and um, had so, a barbecue, um, pork and chicken in a glaze with soy sauce and honey, and mm. um, had some potato salad, potato salad with celery on it. That's my recent highlight. Um. So I think my recent highlights, so last week I got a text from a friend who I hadn't seen in a long time, um, who lives um, reasonably far away, uh, just saying that he was in the area with his family. So um, so we met up and that was just a really nice day. It was a nice day and we were by a body of water. We were by the River Thames and did some walking and some chatting. And it was, yeah, it was good to see, you know, see someone who I wasn't expecting to see. That is a lovely thing to do, do. And I would, at this point, like to remind everyone that please feel free to comment and ask questions and give us a thumb like follow if that's something you would like to do. And yeah, basically, if you have any questions for Rory or myself about the topic that we're doing, especially. But we're going to start off with some general questions that's sometimes my favorite part of the show are you ready i'll try and be quick did you have breakfast yes when did you wake up uh half past six what was the last thing you ate breakfast which was muesli and yogurt and fruit iced coffee or hot tea hot tea a great thing to eat or drink whilst playing games what what is it uh, I'm just going to go with sweets, like some boiled sweets or something that doesn't have any crumbs or sugar. But sweets do have sugar. Well, they not like sugar that falls off them. Okay. And um, who's the last person you spoke to in person? Uh, it's my girlfriend who I spoke to this morning. Okay. And is it just the two of you that live together? By the way, if you do not wish to answer any questions, you are, of course, welcome to pass. No, it's just the two of us, yeah. Um... Books or podcasts? Uh, I'm going to go with books. So I'll do, I do like podcasts, but I'm going to go with books. Okay, what's the last book you enjoyed? Um, I'm reading a novel called Red Rising at the moment, which um, I've seen a few people mention, um, and I sort of stumbled across it a few weeks ago, and it's just great. And so I haven't finished reading it, but nearish the end. What would you say are three themes? Of red rising so far um it's like class struggle um science fiction and um i guess like fantasy if you want to have that as a, mm. as a separate theme i mean like come get i feel like that's one theme and two johns but <laughs> yeah i know i was trying to not spoil the spoil the book because it's i came to it without any 
without knowing much about it. So I'm trying to, um, yeah, without without giving too much away. Okay, I appreciate that. Um, last physical game played um, was a Baron Park, which I played last night, which is a very good game from Phil Walker Harding. I enjoyed is that a lot. Baron Park. Or Baron Park. Yeah, that does make more sense. I mean, the park's not particularly barren. <laughs> it's not, no, no. Baron Park. Or, yeah, Baron Park. And when you're playing a game, what's your favourite colour to play? Um, probably black, but I really don't mind. I'm happy to let other people choose first, so I don't have to make a decision. Cards or cubes? Cards. Mm. Wooden meeple or plastic figurine? Wooden meeple. Left or right seagull? Uh, oh, I'm a f more fond of the left one, I think. Mm, me too. I like that kind of visual symmetry going on. Um, Semi-transparent card standee or plastic figurine? Uh, I'd probably go with plastic figurine in that instance. Okay, how do you keep your games? Vertically, horizontally? Okay. Um, ver uh, it's a mixture vertically, but I don't have a lot of space, so it, it, wh whichever way they can fit in, so it becomes a bit of a Tetris Tetris game. Tell me three games that you enjoy right now. Um, well, Seven Wonders Dual Solo Mode, I've been enjoying a lot. Um, Baron Park. Baron Park, yeah, that's another one. Um, and there's a <laughs> game called um, Amul, which is. I've not heard a lot of people talk about, but I think it's a few years old and it's a little bit like, it's a drafting game, but there's some hand management as well. And yeah, it's- Wait, I think How do you it's spell that? A-M-U-L. Okay, I don't know that one. Oh, wow, it's only from last year, 2019. Yeah, it's, I think it's very, it went very under the radar and it's, um, I, I'm not, I've only played it three or four times, but I, Think it's really good it's I, I tend to like drafting games as you might have, might know from the ones they've, they've talked about but um it's good there's yeah like i said there's some hand management stuff so it's not just a case of picking a card and then playing it you've got to work out when to play it when to keep things in your hand um and yeah i'd like to i've only played it with i think four is the most the the, the large number of people i've played it with i think it goes up to eight which i'm not sure what that would be like but um yeah i'd like to play it with more because it was um it was very fun and do you have a board game shop near you? Um, yeah, I think my nearest is Eclectic Games in Reading, which is a really, really good board game shop if anyone's ever been there. And if you haven't, it's worth going to because it's pretty large and they've got some some good games in there and they're very friendly. Mm, lovely people. Um, Becky and Daryl Ottery. We've um, I not been there myself, although... I was hoping to go there if they did a similar thing to last year for Gen Con, like when they did the mm. pop-up Gen Con last time I went to Fanboy 3. Um, I would like to ask, finally, to finish this off, what's a day been like for you typically in the past few weeks? Um, well, waking up and having some breakfast and then getting to work, which... I normally work from, or used to work from a shared office space, but now I work from home um, for obvious reasons. Um, and then I normally work through the day and then maybe do my, do a walk or exercise in the evening, um, so like five or six o'clock. And then maybe play a game, watch some TV and go to bed, which is, you know, fairly boring, but that's, you know, that's what we are up against at the moment. And... That is the end of the questionably quick questions. And hello, Dina. It's lovely to <laughs> um, see you. I like that comment. Yeah, fancy seeing me online between the hours of 10 and 11 on UK time, of course. I believe it's like two hours ahead over there. But um, so let's get to the main topic, which is what we chatted about. Um, I would like to ask you a bit more about how you start working on a game. And can you actually just give a quick overview of yourself in as much or as little detail as you would like for a couple of minutes? Okay, so I am a graphic designer. 
um, in a broad sense. So I do sort of illustration and graphic design and all those sorts of things. But um, from a, I guess from a like the artwork that I produce is from a kind of graphical perspective. Um, and a few years ago, I got into tabletop, modern tabletop gaming, and then thought I'd like to do some graphic design and or illustration game art um, and started working on a game because I thought that would be a great way to to get into it and then yeah with the help of some playtesting groups like the one in the World Festival Hall and um, got that to a place where I actually thought this is you know this is more than just a portfolio piece I could uh, you know this is something which is potentially something I could produce um, and yeah and that game is Scorer which is now out available from inside the box board games and yeah now i kind of work on on games as well and that's sort of um where i'm where i'm at at the moment the rundown of the last five years i suppose um, and talking about bodies of water you've worked on um a walk along which is another tin game oh no it's an 18 cards game for me cg yes yeah, so this is the, the latest game that I designed, um, which is still in development. <clears throat> um, it's been picked up by Alley Cat. Um, and yeah, it's, it was inspired by um, a trip to Swanage, which is in, in Dorset, on the south coast, um, last year. And um, I guess it, it's typical of the way that I work is that I was at Swanage Pier and I thought the, a pier is kind of like if you, the separate sections of a pier are a little bit like a playing card in a way, in the shape of them. Um, and so I had a, a visual in my mind and I worked on the game design at that point on that trip and it actually wasn't very good. And so I parked it, but I had still had the visual in mind. Um, and then um, actually just before lockdown, I had a very sort of uh, an idea for something and then quickly designed and developed it and did some play testing during lockdown um did some play setting with Alley Cat and they liked it enough to pick it up. Um like I say it needs it needs some work and it's being developed at the moment. But um yeah it's that should um I'm hoping next year that will be out. And hello Alex by the way it's lovely to see you with us. And um to get into the graphic design Rory that you're you've been doing so clearly based on the Tinder block stuff this is your um, illustration graphic mm -hmm. design work that you've done here. So you've um, made all the everything that you see here, right? I mean, not the actual molding of the tins, but in terms of graphically, what is printed on the tin, you shifted all those pixels or curved all those vectors. Yeah, so I, that I, I I I sort of introduced myself as a graphic designer, and and but I you know I do I do art art as well because I know a lot of graphic designers that just focus on on that the the actual graphical layout of things. But um, I, I I think that the illustration style that I do, or the illustrations that I do, are they come from a graphic design place. Um, so sim, you know, I, I like to approach art in a way that is similar to to design if that makes sense um so yeah i don't i don't tend to do kind of overly paintedly illustrations or um I, you know occasionally do kind of sketchy stuff but it's mostly like graphical shapes and color um bringing those together to create illustration and artwork so um you're clearly a visual thinker, so I guess that reflects into why you start off thinking visually. Yeah, so I think it's not necessarily having like a fixed idea about um, what I want the artwork to look like, but it's having, um, and this might sound a bit intangible, but having an idea of what I want the final product to represent, um, you know, whether it's like uh, I have a particular colour scheme in mind or a particular feeling that I want that game to evoke and I think a big part of that for me is is the visuals um, and obviously once that idea is brewing then I think that I it's almost like I then have to or I want to try and design the game to fit in with that that ideal um, so with Pier 18 for example you know I, I had this idea about making seaside piers um, 
but it was it came from a visual place and because um i had this idea that i wanted it to be quite simple but uh, uh, the uh, the artwork to be evocative it, it felt like the game design had to be simple and evocative too um hence why i went down the route of uh, like a small 18 card game because i wanted it to mm. feel like it was i wanted it to feel like something that you could play on a on a trip to the seaside um so it's almost like um setting myself a brief for the game design you know i'm a new game designer i've not i've i've not done a huge amount of game design but that's how i like to approach it is to give myself a bit of a brief and the brief normally comes from well i want it to look like this so i feel like it should play like this too we've got some questions from dina um um dina let me know when you get to new projects where do you usually start is this talking i assume this is talking about any graphic design process um and what's the onboarding process when you get hired? So when I get uh, when I start a new project, um, I do tend to do a lot of sketching. Um, so kind of rough, um, rough sketches, which might not get seen by anyone other than me or the person I'm working with. Um, and from there, it's then working on maybe some slightly more polished visuals. I mean, when I'm doing game design, what I tend to do is, even though I've got an, a visual idea in my mind, I won't make a fully worked up prototype because, you know, as anyone who's ever tried to design a game will know, sometimes you can have an idea for a game and you play test it and it doesn't work. And so mm. I don't, you know, whilst I've got an idea of what I want it to look like, I won't make finished artwork until I've play tested it a few times and I feel like there's something there, there's something interesting, even if it needs a lot of development, but I feel like it's it's fun, then I might work on some artwork because I, I want to get that process started pretty quickly. Um, because as you said at the top of the um, the top of the stream, I want those ideas to feed into each other. I want the artwork to, to permeate into the rules, into the mechanics. Um, and in terms of onboarding um, a project um, when I get hired, uh, it happens in... Let's talk about this one randomly, because this was by Aidan Laufer and Simon Milburn. 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 Milburn, that's the one. Um, yeah, so this is a great example of, uh, I guess, uh, 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 you know, not maybe not a, str uh, a normal way into, into doing a project. So I met Aidan at Handycon. Um, he playtested Scorer and he provided some great feedback and so we kept in touch afterwards and I saw that he was working on Solar Storm and they had a few, um, uh, him and Simon had a few logo ideas and um, he wasn't quite sure if they were working or not so I just sent him an email saying look I've, I've got an idea for what how, how a logo could work for Solar Storm and I sent him like a, a in fact, it was fairly worked a fairly worked up logo because I was pretty confident that it would be the right the right logo for the game, which you know is a bit presumptuous of me because he could have turned around and said, "You know, stay out of my business." But he was grateful for me reaching out and um, hired me to do the logo, and I ended up doing some other little bits and bobs um, card layout in the um, in the actual game itself. Um, so that was the process of getting hired. So in that instance, it was me reaching out to to someone and saying, look, I think I think I could do something here to help you. Um, sometimes it's the other way around where someone will reach out to me and say, you know, I think your style could work really well for this game. Um, but I, I think it's, um, I think to be any, you know, well, I think to be any kind of creative person working for yourself, you have to be a bit of an opportunist. And if you see mm. opportunities, you have to reach out and it's not easy to reach out to people. You've got to put yourself out there. But um, I think it's, it's a, you know, that's for me, that's how I've made contacts in the board game industry is reaching out to people or doing things speculatively and saying, you know, I think this could be, this could be a cool piece of artwork for your game. And sometimes that works and sometimes it doesn't. But um, I see it as it's not a wasted, it's not a wasted time because I'm learning. I'm learning about how I work and I'm learning about how other, how other people work. Um, so yeah, that's that's kind of how, how it is for me. I mean, I know that um, Ryan Lockhart um, from Near and Far and Above and Below has gone on record as saying one of the first things that they do when they start a game is to actually draw the front cover of it. 
Yeah. Because what they feel, even if it's not necessarily the actual final arts work, maybe they're going to repaint it, maybe, but it will at least be a Cutler sketch because they want to have, okay, this is a overall mood and this is what I'm going for. I mean, yeah. I feel like within any game that you start and um, we've got a lot of props for like your talents and um, you know that Dina saying it looks gorgeous and um, Alex saying yeah Dranda did a great job I would agree and they've won they're in the listing at least for a couple of awards and so yeah. well done to them um, but yeah surely at the end of the day it's all a way of kind of narrowing down what exactly are you making. I mean, if I've been told hypothetically by a big company, okay, this is what we would like to make. This is the kind of game that we think that we could sell a large number of. Then I'm kind of thinking, okay, I'm going to work within this space mm. and I'm going to try and work something speculatively to try and get it made for them. If I've got a mechanic that I'm just playing around with on my own. Anything that you're actually doing with a view to mass production, let's say, as opposed to just, um, you know, okay, it might be that this mechanic is interesting and, or, oh, let's say in a bond, the only reason that that's a thing is because for, I was like, you know what, this could be a thing and it would be funny and I'd enjoy it and I get some gleeful joy out of it. it you, maybe that's a bit more self-serving because I'm like, oh, I wonder what it would be like. I wonder if you could have people working on the economic game whilst other people are contorting. That would be a bit weird, but maybe it just might work. Mm. Or if I've got an idea for a new auction mechanism, maybe I just want to play test it. Not necessarily just because I think it's going to be a good game, but because I think I want to understand this potential auction mechanism and see can it work in a future thing. But when you're actually working for a mass produced thing, it feels to me like you want to narrow down the scope. You want to know what you're making, however you do that, whether that is by virtue of components, um, box art, um, theme, player counts, whatever. Would you broadly agree with that? Yeah, absolutely. I think, well, I mean, there's two things for me, really. Like, one is I find and my mind like you know my mind will wander if I don't have any constraints if I'm not thinking about what the game is going to be eventually and I'm, within that it can change a lot but if I think I want this to be a small box game or I want this to be a game which has got this kind of vibe to it or I want this to be a game that uses this particular art style having constraints like that um helps to keep me focused because if I start wandering off on some ideas that don't fit within that constraints, then I know I can park those for another game or I can completely ditch them mm -hmm. and say, that's not right for this. So let's just focus on what I'm focusing on. And then the other thing, which I think is really important for me, and I don't, you know, um, it would be interesting to hear your perspective as well as a, a game designer, but I feel like I need some, I need things to keep me motivated and working on a game is a long process even the small small games it's it can be a very long and tiring process because you sometimes spend a lot of time on a mechanic or or an idea or a theme which ultimately isn't right and you have to just get rid of it and that can be tiring um, and so I feel like having an idea about artwork or using artwork as I'm going along is a way of keeping me motivated so if I get to a stage where I feel like a prototype I've played tested a prototype and it's done well and I've got some changes when I make the next prototype, I might add in some artwork, you know, and it might be some, I might mm. work on some more refined icons or I might work on the game logo or just put some color. And seeing that new prototype, which I'm then going to go and play test with a little bit more art on it, helps me feel like I'm further along the process, you know, um, and that's um, keeping myself motivated is, I think, really important and um, I, I think there's probably a lot of game designers that have good ideas, but they they get knocked down because they get some 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 feedback which they don't agree with, or 
they feel like their game needs reworking and because they get well, knocked there, out, have, there have been some great philosophers who say that maybe you get knocked down but you should get, get up, up again. again exactly yeah and um <laughs> and i think i use artwork a lot to do that um and uh, yeah it's interesting i would be interested to hear from other designers how they keep themselves motivated um I, I imagine there's a lot of game designers that are just you know they're so interested in the game mechanics that that's enough to keep them going but for me um i tend to play lighter you know lighter kind of gateway or family style games and so where there's maybe less mechanics or there's less in you know there's less interlocking mechanisms so for me keeping some something to that i can keep going back to and, and think well I've, I've reached a point in this where it's going well, so I'm going to keep, I'm going to push it a bit further. And what I end up with the next prototype feels like it's slightly closer to the finished product. And that's exciting for me because that's what I want to do. I want to make a finished product at the end of the day. If I feel like a game is good, I, the ideal is to get it in front of people, um, whether that's through self publishing, which I've not really looked into, or um, approaching a publisher. I mean, that's kind of ultimately what I want to do is get my artwork and, and designs in front of people. And I mean, yeah, I think having that initial idea of what you're doing, I think is a good way to keep yourself grounded and maybe potentially keep yourself motivated. Dina has said that they do a photo shoot and costume design for a character in their games to capture the feeling of that game, give in Dina a visual idea on how the game should feel and play. And yeah. I think that's prob yeah. Um like if I had a cover like Ryan Lockat or Amazing Graphic Design, I'd be like, well, I've put work into it, so I should do it. But um I don't know, for me it's basically just what's it going to turn to, if you know what I mean? Like um I've got into the point where I've started quoting myself a lot, which I'm a, where it might be a dangerous thing, but I feel like, you know, fundamentally, is it likely to turn into something good? Am I enjoying the process or, you know, am I obliged to do it? Mm. And that is the three things that I kind of said, well, if none of those are true, let's stop doing it because there's no point in doing it. Like, frankly, if I wasn't enjoying this, like this daily live stream, you know, I know that some people tune in, but I'm not really obliged as such. It's not like anyone's paying me or I'm like, anyone's life really depends on it or anything. And if I wasn't getting some benefit to myself or if I didn't feel okay, it's likely to turn into it's continuing to grow, which I really love, like there's tending to be like another person joining every couple of weeks, which is lovely. And I kind of feel like looking at those three aspects, how many of them can you hit? Mm. Um, like Dina says that to keep them motivated, they need pressure by saying it can be play tested when in reality they haven't worked on it for over a month. So that's kind of going back to the, are you obliged to do it? And meeting those obligations, like saying to the, um, someone who's grabbing games for a company, okay, I, I'm going to set up a meeting for you in two weeks' time, even though I might not have an actual game yet. I mean, there is that whole thing about, um, yeah, deadlines, and deadlines do breed creativity. They do put pressure on us, as, as long as it's possible, do you know what I mean? Yeah. And I might say, hey, I've got this vague idea. I'm going to tell you about it in vague terms. And then if someone says, oh, that sounds vaguely interesting, then boom, that's a little bit more obligation. Like, mm. seize the power. Um, frankly, if... Yeah, I did kind of show it to a couple of companies, including ITB, because I was okay, I would like it to go somewhere. But also, um, to some degree... It felt like a game that if no one had wanted it, I would have probably wanted to self-publish it. But by the virtue of another company saying, okay, we want to do it, then we, then I am kind of obliged to do it because now there's people looking forward to it. And 
if you've got a co-designer, you've got a bit more obligation. How can you build up that obligation for yourself? Maybe yeah. just by sharing bits about the game. And by um, then, are you enjoying it? Make sure that you do um, play, do things in a way that you enjoy. I think that um, I've realized that I really hate working in tabletop simulator. So frankly, I'm like, just, yeah, I'm not going to do that. I don't feel like it has to be done that way. And I would rather just, I know I am lo losing out on a lot of potential data that I could be gathering, especially for more involved games, but it feels like, yeah, let's go and move to showing games to Chris and McCall. I know it's a very small group, but I can still get some feedback. They're not going to bullshit me. Mm. Um, Chris, if they don't like a game, they will tell me. And certainly for a type of game that Chris or McCall might want to play, I'm going to get that feedback. Same with Layla. There are at least a couple of people in my life, even today, that I can continue to play with and make that somewhat enjoyable. Make it games that I don't hate to play. Make it games that I at least get some enjoyment from watching others play or playing myself. And thinking, how can you make the thing more enjoyable? What you talked about of having um, little bits of art along the way. For me, it's sometimes okay. Um, I'm going to start... Yeah, sometimes some of the bits that I really don't want to do i'll kind of get chris to do it these days instead of me just like him um, assembling prototypes and stuff but um when it's a case of okay just drawing bits on cards actually that's quite fun if i just block up the bits of time and i'm sure that um although there is a yeah some of the things that i've been working on recently are speculative things for I know people say share your ideas, it's all good, but there is a part where you go into true mass markets and the toy related industries. If I'm striving for that kind of thing, there is a lot more um, secrecy. But the third thing is like making something that I believe is worth, or hopefully worthwhile, and mm. having that. Um, sorts of okay let's think of lots of ideas let's play it and then if chris or mccall won't really want to play it again then great and we will if chris or mccall wanted to play it three times in a row one night then it's hopefully it's not just because i made the game because they play a lot of games that i make and they don't want to play all of them repeatedly mm. i mean yesterday they all said yeah we're not playing yogi or in a bind we just don't have the um desire which is why we didn't end up playing in a bond because no one wanted to be companies because it was too hot and sticky and we sure. all just ended up chilling and eating but and it like you get what i'm saying like kind of with the um making something valuable maybe not being too fixed to one thing being willing to change it being willing to say okay i'm going to swap things around as we go and anyway yeah, I think um, I've seen that a lot of people who say you shouldn't do artwork for a prototype because it, then you get too attached to it, which I think there is a definite, definitely an argument for that. But I think it's about your own perceptions. And for me, maybe it's because I, you know, I, I'm a, I trained to be a graphic designer and I've worked at places where uh, agency, design agencies, where you do work and then it gets scrapped. I don't feel like I don't feel I'm ever so attached to something that I wouldn't change it. Um, so, you know, I think there's about, for me, is about having a, vi a vision and um, enjoying, like you were saying, enjoying all parts of the process mm -hmm. and creating artwork gives me some obligation because I've made, I've put some time into it, but um, I don't, I don't think I, I mean, touch wood, I don't think I've ever been in a situation where I've dug my heels in and, and said, I won't do, I won't change that because it would mean going back and redoing the artwork. If anything, I sort of enjoy the opportunity to go and, and redo it, recreate it better. Um, and it's like, that's like game design really, is like you can carry on working on a game forever. You could keep tweaking and refining. And I think it, 
at some point you have to um, just say, this is this is fun, this is what people are enjoying, I like it, I think it's ready, and then, then it's done. I think that ultimately that is the one downside, arguably the only downside um, of making your own artwork is the opportunity cost. Because if you're able to make nice looking artwork, um, A, that's time that Aqua Zulu, Alex is saying, well, it takes that time away from the actual rules design. And the other thing is, once you've drawn that mage mouse, are you then thinking, okay, well, maybe this mage mouse shouldn't have this stuff. Maybe it should have, like, a scythe that's just um, a lot better for the game. I don't know, you mm. know, what's going on in the game. Maybe originally you draw it with, uh, um, like, big one d stick and then you're like oh actually what i really want this made i drew it with like a fire spell but fire spells aren't appropriate in this game but maybe you keep the fire spells in this game just because you drew a really cool image and um for me doing kitty cataclysm i think there were at least um five decks that i redrew literally every single card so i don't even just mean the like when there was a catch here i would draw a catch here and then duplicate it i was drawing it like straight onto the cards and like the 55 card deck i think it was um drawing literally every card like straight onto the cards because it's okay um trying to work how it's exactly where things should go yes it looks very scrappy right now but how exactly should these puns be portrayed and it's because of that that originally catch here it was like a cheerleader with the pom-poms and then it was through that process that I ended up with something more like this, where um, Leila said, yeah, I love that. That defines my current mood perfectly. So enthusiastic and yay. But um, yeah, you can leave it until the end, but having them build up alongside each other, if you can do it, and I, I'm acknowledging that... Um, we are both people who, and I don't want to self-aggrandize too much, but we are both people who are able to make things that other people say, yeah, that looks good. And we are both able to make games that other people have said, yeah, that is fun. At least, you know, in bo both instances, um, good enough for people to pay some degree of money for. And I hate narrowing everything down to money, but you know, there's a certain point where it's like, okay, money helps me fight away the imposter syndrome. Uh. And um, if you, yeah, absolutely. So how do you kind of, do you think you would always be making the, your art for your own games? Um, it's interesting. I've thought about that actually. Um... I, I don't know. I, I have an idea for a game which I, in my mind, I don't think my art style would suit it. Um, and I've not really developed it. I've not really worked on it. But it's a it's a concept that I'd like to at some point work on. Um, I think at the moment, yes, while I'm, you know, while I'm still quite new to it, because, you know, ultimately, um, I want, you know, I want other publishers and designers to to pay me to work on their games and mm. um, working on artwork for my own games is a way of building up uh, you know a body of work which I can show to people and say this is the sort of thing I do um, and yeah I think I think I do for the time being but I, I, it, it, even if I wasn't doing the artwork directly I think I would like to be involved in the art direction um, mm you know, working with an artist, another artist, and having some sort of creative control over it. Because I think for, I think it's, for me, part of the DNA of games that I design is I want to, I want them to, to have a visual aspect that I've inputted into. I mean, it feels like, um, yeah, a very kind of autory thing to say that, okay, you want to have this one guiding vision behind the game 
and be like, okay, everyone, everything matches up to be this singular vision. Um, is that kind of how you see it? And yeah, um, I think so. But it's about having, I think it's about having a vision, but allowing yourself to 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 be you know to be guided by other things so that's why I, I guess I try and make the distinction of like it's not like I have an idea for a game and it's set, set in stone the actual game you know the artwork in my mind I think I, it's more about I have an idea for what I want it to 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 achieve visually so maybe I want it to be um, kind of to be very minimalist or maybe I want to work with a certain color palette or something like that and so you know, in the developing of the game, if things happen like, oh, suddenly those cards aren't needed or suddenly there's a board instead of, um, or uh, there's a board instead of some cards or whatever it is, I can, I'm not feeling like I'm being derailed from something because the, the vision idea is quite broad and, and that those all, those, all, those changes all fit in within that broad vision. Um, so yeah, I guess it's, the vision is really important for me. I think if I can't visualize what a game is going to be like before I start designing it, in terms of the vibe, the feel of it, then I, I think I, st I struggle with with actually pushing forward with it. Hmm. Um, so I have to have some kind of idea about about it visually before I, before I start. Um, so yeah, for my process, it's really important. I mean, you've got a lot of redesigns of things, as you said, speculative thing on your Instagram. Mm -hmm. And there's, of course, Glory to Rome, which was started off as a fan version and then for the Black Box edition, I believe. Yeah. Um, if I'm getting my terms right, by Heiko Gunther. Yeah, that rings a bell. I, yeah, I know. I know what you mean. I, I can picture it in but, my mind. Um, I mean, I was slightly reminded of that by your Emachi Koro stuff, just flicking through it so a wee bit earlier that people saw. Um, how do you think of... Um, I mean, doesn't that kind of suggest that actually these things are completely separate? That... Um, you can take a game and completely reuse skin it and have it be just as um, valid and reasonable. Yeah, I think so. But for me, when I when I approach like a, which I don't do as much anymore. I did when I started out. When I look, when I was looking at kind of looking at elements of games, it was. And again, this is maybe a bit of an egotistical thing to say because I wasn't involved in the game at all. But sometimes I'll play a game and I'll think. It feel I feel I'll have a feeling about what I think the artwork could have been not necessarily not necessarily that's the right feeling, but for me personally, I think well, I think well as I'm playing this game, I have a feel for it, and the feeling maybe doesn't match the artwork that I'm seeing, and so I'll maybe I'll a lot for my own benefit. I'll I'll be like, well, what if I you know what if the artwork looked like this, and um, I think that's a you know, I, it's hard to say. That's not me saying that I that games. I, I look at games and I think the artwork is wrong because I don't. That's not that's not it at all. But sometimes I play games and I think, oh, wouldn't it? I wonder how how artwork like this would affect the, the the way that people play the game. And so it's a kind of exploration thing um, because I do think I do fundamentally believe that the the artwork in a game, the way the artwork is presented. Um, does affect the way that people play the game. Um, you know, I think there are instances yeah. where, where, like Baron Park, for example, is a great, you know, we we played that last night and we played it with the monorail ex expansion for the first time. Now, the monorail is, is if you've not played the game, is a little 3D cardboard element that you place on top of your park. And that's a new mechanic, but it's all it, Functionally, all it's doing is adding another another level of scoring. Is that adding another scoring tier, which is, you know, as valid as all the other scoring tiers. But because it was, it's so visually exciting to look at, it felt like the players in the game were 
going down that strategy because it was exciting. It was it looked more exciting than the other elements mm. of the board. <laughs> so I think that that's really I find that sort of thing really interesting. And like you know, I, I've seen it when people play games before when there's a, a card with particularly cool artwork. Players will actively try and get it because they 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 like the artwork. They want they want to have that card. And I think that's a really interesting level of game design that I think is maybe a little bit untapped and could be looked at more. You know, I'm absolutely don't know anything about psychology, but there must be some psycho. You know, there must be some some reason people are drawn to particular elements of a game and not and not other elements of it um and so yeah i think a lot of the stuff i do is is just exploration it's not it's not me saying i think this is a better art style for this game it's me just seeing what if the game had artwork like this how would i how would that change the way that i think about it um so sure yeah and um i don't take it as that although i certainly think that um most people saw it that way for the sake of glory to Rome, but I certainly don't. And it was explicitly stated that um, person felt like they didn't like it much. And I personally much prefer um, glory to Rome black box than the original um, sort of clamshell with the cartoony stuff that feels a bit um, garish. Mm. Um, certainly. Um, theme does impact gameplay decisions it has been shown in jeff engelstein's thing i don't know if you're aware of that where they re-themed um the oh what's the game where you're going into the temple and then you come out ink and gold okay there, yeah previously diamond and then and um, there were different themed versions and people did indeed play differently at least for their initial games but once they had played so many times, the ways that people played, regardless of the theme, converged. Now, um, in the same way, if we've got a theme of hive, of insects, even if we keep the theme exactly the same, the exact way that this is going to be represented, um, even with the official versions, let's compare um, Hive Pocket, which mm -hmm. is exactly the same artwork to the big version, or the old version to the current version, or the carbon black and white version to the normal version, that's surely going to affect something of um, how you might then play it and the decisions that you might make, at least in your first few games, how you approach it. And I think, yeah, and I think also it, it, as a as a product, you know, I think like um, I got um, I pocket i bought it from a, and i can't remember the name of the game shop but it was a, a game shop in edinburgh and what was when i didn't have very many games i went in there and i said look i want i, I like small games because that's what i was playing a lot of the time and i said i want a small something small i can put in my rucksack and um the chap in the shop um showed me hive pocket and, and i bought hive pocket and really enjoyed it but i think had they shown me hive the big the you know the the bigger tiled version of Hive, I'm not sure I would have bought it because it wasn't specifically what, it didn't fit the sort of game that I wanted to buy at that time, um, which is really interesting because functionally, I would you know, playing Hive is exactly the same as playing Hive Pocket, but um, I probably wouldn't have come to that game um, had Hive Pocket not existed. Because um, you so, think it looked slightly cuter or? Uh, I think it was just about, you know the functionality of it like the amount of space table space that we we have at home um wanting a game that was really portable that i could i could put in my pocket um and i think a lot a, a lot of the time I pl i'll play games and i'll think and i'll kind of bounce off them because I, they part of the production of them doesn't I don't know, it doesn't work for my scenario. Like when I lay out all the cards, they don't fit on the small gaming space that I have. And I think, well, I can't really enjoy their game because it doesn't fit within my lifestyle. And that's entirely me. You know, the game, you know, it's not like there's a problem with the game. It's just the game doesn't really work, doesn't fit in with, with, what, with what I need. And so that's really interesting as well. I think like the stuff that I did for Hive here um, was 
uh, just again, I was exploring um, hexagons and Hive is all about hexagons. Obviously it's part of the theme because in bees, you know, famously make hexagon hives and you're playing as bees and insects. And so I thought, wouldn't it be cool to see Hive with hexagons all the way through? So that all the creatures, the icons that are created are all made from a hexagon grid. Um, mm. So that's, it was just a bit of, I think, you know, this might be a fun thing to do. Um, so, you know, I, I kind of put a lot of the work that I do on Instagram, um, but it's, it, a lot of it is just exploration. And um, I guess it's like me showing a sketchbook, um, but because of the way I work, it's done in a particular style that maybe looks a bit more um, fleshed out than a sketchbook. But, you know, some of the ideas that I put up on there might be like five minute, I'll quickly do a five minute comp for something and I'll be like, oh, this is interesting. And I'll, I'll put it out there. But um, yeah, I think that's the, like the idea of what the product is at the end is really, really interests me um, because I definitely think there are games which personally I have liked. I've enjoyed playing them, but there's something about the product which doesn't really sit well with me. Maybe it's too many, I feel like there's too many compo components or the box is too big and it won't fit in my, on my shelf. And then I bounce off that game because um, the product isn't quite right for me. And I think that's an interesting area to explore as well. There's definitely a lot of really interesting work to explore and yeah certainly I'm just kind of keep coming back to the central question of how much does the arts work and the graphic design influence the um, you know game I mean does it really matter where you start I mean does going back and forth always results in a tighter marriage of the two no i mean i don't think so i think sorry to interrupt i was going to say i think it's about the design i think it's about the designer specifically how they come to the game and for for me i think that's an important part of my process because that's how i work but you know that's why i i struggle when i see threads on board game geek saying this is the the number one you know follow these steps if you want to get your game published and it's um and i think yes there are certain things that you you need to do when you're making a game you need to play test it you need to have it in front of different people because everyone comes to a game differently but i do think there are elements which are flexible in that and i think having a broader way of coming to games coming to game design will only bring more people to it and will only benefit from better games in the long run. So I think um, for me, as someone who came from, from an art background into game design, having art that right there is, I can lean on something which I'm familiar with when I'm working on something which I'm less familiar with, which is game design. So mm. I think that's really important. And I guess I try, you know, I want to, if I've got any opportunity to speak to people who are interested in game design, I'd like to try and push that a little bit and say, you know, if if you're if you're interested in game design, but maybe you feel like you're more interested in game art, then start with the art, and then see where that takes you. Um, so, I think it's because I think you know you can like artwork can can have an impact on the game mechanics, and game mechanics can have an impact on the artwork, and if you're in a position where you can do both oh, for yeah. sure like i mean here you've done a kind of reimagining of welcome to dino world which um i did a bit of help with um and very much i can't, can't remember who did the graphic design for that do you know off the top of your head i, I feel i like should no, know i don't actually uh, um i um, don't but basically, yeah, the person who did the original, you know, let's all stick dinosaurs, you know, that influences some people at least to draw them. And the idea is that, okay, that this is a simple thing that you can recreate. And that's, influ I mean, especially with a role and right, I'm saying this is what you can draw. These are the lines that you can follow. Hey, look at um, 
what's the word what's the one where you're making the train light line lines oh, rail railroad ink yeah thank you railroad ink where it kind of shows one as a double line one as a single line with kind of dashes and everyone sees that and so they could do their double line and the dashy line or they could do something else but it shows okay this is the artwork to recreate you've got to think okay not just about making it look pretty but making it something that um people are able to recreate easily in a way that is identifiable and i've got yeah unless you're lazy like me and then you're play testing um welcome to dino world and you're like yeah i'm just going to write the letters of the dinosaurs that no, call I think that's really interesting as well, isn't it? And it sort of, um, you know, like I've played Welcome to Dino World a few times with different people and, you know, the game itself is really good fun, but a lot of the enjoyment comes from people having, you know, laughing at each other's dinosaurs because it's not just a case of if you're a good, you know, if you're good at drawing, you can draw a good dinosaur because you're having to contort them into different shapes, the different shaped pens everyone's dinosaurs end up looking kind of crazy and you and it's like you're starting with a prompt which is the the artwork in the game and then you're making your own version of that prompt and that's almost like a part of the game which is like an un isn't isn't you know it's not it's not within the rules but it's definitely a fun thing that people enjoy doing um and that's really interesting as well because it's you know there's you could play the game like you were saying where you just write the letter of the dinosaur but i think a lot of enjoyment in my experience of people playing that game is drawing the dinosaurs and then laughing at their own dinosaurs and laughing at each other's dinosaurs in a very you know in a in a friendly way um and it's a it's a big part of that experience i mean that's a really good point and i think that it leads us to rules that on the surface of things they don't have any mechanical relevance mm. um for example let's look at uno um, like, is there, I don't know what the official ruling on is, if you are allowed to ask people how, whether they've done the car, how many cards are in their hand, but, um, I mean, I guess if you're not allowed to ask, then arguably there's some mechanical relevance, but as I saw it, that rule was just there to be like, okay, well, this isn't a game where people are going to be paying a lot of attention, at least now you know this person's a, about to go out and it gives it a bit of uh, tension and a bit of climax towards the end when someone's about to go out and you have to do that. Um, similarly, I mean, in my own in a Bind Yogi, just the vocalization rule saying you need to read the card out loud means that everyone's informed of the game state. Um, what you're talking about of drawing the thing even if it doesn't say you need to draw it particularly well, then maybe, yeah, that does add something to the game. And I know that with that game, it was very much designed um, and, yeah, as being a far more strategic rule and right than had existed up until that point, that the artwork wouldn't necessarily be part of it. But Patchwork Doodle, the way that people, you know, you don't need to draw any different bits in a different way. But if you do desire to do so, then at the end, you've got something that's uniquely yours. And that's maybe part of the charm of a mm. rolling night. Yeah. And I think that's part of the, I think that's part of the enjoyment of a lot of games, isn't it? It's like creating, it's creating or building something which is of your own design, whether that's a, tableau of cards or a, a, an engine or uh, drawings on a roll and write i think that that seems to be a lot of the reason that people enjoy enjoy games is 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 your you're left with something at the end which is something you've created even if that's just what sets you've decided to collect in a set collection game um it's your decision it's it's your these are your things and um yeah i think that's that's definitely a part of it mm strikes me that yeah this is all about that mood and there's a lot higher investment i mean for someone like um yeah see who doesn't feel comfortable maybe doing artwork so much and um, maybe having to 
I'd be interested to know if you have played Welcome to Dino World, Kate, um, like and how you play it. Would you just write the letters, or would you make any attempt to do the little stick figure dinosaurs? I mean, it feels like a game that you might enjoy. Um, okay, but um, I mean, what I'm kind of thinking is that the artwork that the game presents with you, you with is quite passive. Um, okay, there we go. But at a certain point, even if you are, if even if you say, and I know, say kind of jokes around, but even if you clearly don't enjoy doing art, that you feel, oh, I'm sad that everyone else is better than mine. But having stick figures, something that you feel is approachable, or doing doodles, and some of Kate's doodles that I've seen are gorgeous, and um, it gives you an outlet for your expression. It doesn't have to be as demanded like um, Art Deck, the game which is literally, a, if you know that game, I don't Art Deck, that it's literally about drawing. So you've got cards that say, okay, you need to draw a thing that's you need to make a mark on this paper. Um, so it's almost like Mad Libs. Um, you will draw circles whilst holding the end of the pen over and over. And so with those three cards, you now draw circles holding the end of the pen over and over. And now it's the next person's turn. They put down the cards and maybe it's you'll draw circles whilst holding the end of the pen as emotionally as you can. And then they will do that. Oh, why am I drawing this circle? Or maybe they will interpret that however they want. And there are cards where you manage to claim the artwork. And the official rules for winning are once you've gone through all the things and pe all the bits of artwork have been claimed, then everyone, whoever has the best bits of artwork wins. So it doesn't even matter if you didn't add anything to the artwork. It's just the winning condition is just for playing the card to say you claimed it, which is kind of fun mm. and arguably a commentary on, you know, commercialization or, and commodification of arts. But um, yeah, it's like just having lots of things it, it can be something really soothing it can be something exhilarating and other people can take joy in it if you're playing a game that's purely about that and then you have games where it's like um scora or um yeah your peer 18 where um you know it's sort of um it's just okay the graphic design is just to communicate what's going on and um but it still imbues it let's talk about let's try and wrap this up because i would like to get to the good the bad and the examples or the tips okay so um i mean i feel like if I'd been more organized, we would have started off this way. We would have said, okay, what exactly are we talking about, Rory? What are we talking about today? Yeah, what have we been talking about? We've been talking about um, artwork and the, ro the role that artwork plays in game design um, and how it might, it might be able to affect mechanics. Um, and... and when you say artwork, you're not just talking about illustration. You're talking about the graphic design. You're talking about the visual representation of everything going on. That's you, right. Would you include the sculpting? Would you include um, any 3D representational elements? Yeah, absolutely. So when um, Scorer, when I when I signed that with um, inside the box, we had some discussions about the player pieces um, and um, a little bit of back and forth, deciding what would be the best approach. And I'm really happy with what we ended up with. Um, and ITB were great in as much as they let me kind of, I guess. Re retain as the art director on that project. Um, so when I pitched it to them, it had a lot of the artwork in there. Um, as we developed it, that added in some new artwork, uh, including the player pieces. So yeah, I think um, for me, the art, the artwork. When I talk about artwork, I'm talking about the the finished product. You know, what does and that can be 
what's what does the box look like what's what is the size of the box is it even a box um and you know so much of board games i think is the the the, the thing you know a lot of people buy games and they don't play them or they play them once and then they keep it on their shelf and it's something that they just like to look at and that's absolutely fine it's a it's a collector's hobby and to be a collector's hobby i think you have to consider what the actual product is from from everything from the pieces the artwork to the manual to the box to all of those things consider it all from an from an artistic perspective and how how can this be good how do you think that you can be have things working in harmony um i think having someone with a vision and that doesn't necessarily need to be the artist or the illustrator or the graphic designer it can be just someone who is heavily involved in the pro project and and sticks to a vision so um i think someone mentioned um earlier earlier on solar storm being a really great game and i know that, that aiden when i when i was working with him on the, the logo you know and when i was when i um, played the game with him and when i spoke to him about it really you know he had a very considered approach to the art direction you know which artists to hire and when they weren't available which artists to hire to stand in um and when you play that game it's a very complete experience you know everything feels like it's been considered so i think how can it be good is having someone having an overarching role over all of it as someone who is overseeing the illustration the graphic design the sculpting you know if that's not the same person then who is in control of all of that to make sure that they all work together? So yeah, I can still hear you just to let you know something's happened in the past 10 um, minutes with your microphone. Like oh, okay. lots of the treble has gone out or something. Um, any, am I any better? Yeah, you're better now. Okay, maybe I need to lean forward a bit more. Um, yes, yeah, so I did hear all that and um, I think that the idea of having someone, I mean, that's why you get an art director, why it's an actual job, having someone who has that vision, maybe just for, in Magic the Gathering, every set has to look a bit different. I mean, for the fairy tale one, you're going to hire people like Rebecca Gui, or um, for those who n don't know, like it's more of a watercolor, like illustrative approach, whereas for some, you know, another thing, you might have people who are a little bit more... No, you've got to match the style and tone of every single thing. And you want to have someone who is ideally going to look to every single element to say, why is this here? Hmm. And yeah. um, it does occur to me that, of course, there are so many aspects that go into this, not just um, especially with the outside of the box, sadly, it's not just about offering the best experience. It is about, um, you know, marketability and getting that box off a shop for someone to pick it up, for someone to want to buy it. And then also people say, you know, when it's on someone's shelf, for it to be marketing itself so that other people want to pick it up, if you know what I mean. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. Um how can it be bad um i think if the artwork ever gets in the way of the game so um if you have you know i think a classic example in graphic from graph from a graphic design perspective is when you have text that's too small or that's on a low contrast background so it's hard to read for people with perhaps not great eyesight when you have iconography which is conflicting or confusing or icons that don't aren't distinct enough so that people get them muddled up. Um, I think from that's from a very very at a very granular level. I think that's where it can go wrong. I think at a much bigger level, um, you know, it's what we talked about with an art director. Is sometimes you see games where they might have very beautiful illustration, but maybe the graphic design doesn't quite line up with it. You know, it might be kind of fantasy style game and that's how the game plays but then the graphic design might be might not fit into that it might not fit into that world um and i think that's an example of not having a clear vision or not having the ability to 
um, pull on these different strings, which is sometimes not the case. I know with a lot of people, particularly self-funded projects, you know, there's a limited budget and it might be mm. that you pay for an artist and then people are doing the graphic design themselves or, or vice versa. Um, and so I think that can be that can be difficult and that's definitely a challenge for for games is how you knit everything together. Um, and it doesn't necessarily, you know, you can have games that might have poor graphic design or poor artwork, but are still enjoyable to play, but you're not really give, you're not giving the game the best chance you can for it to succeed because if there's ever reason that people might bounce off it or not want to buy it um i think a lot of the time that could be artwork um you know people look at artwork that they don't like that doesn't speak to them and then they're like i don't want to play that game even if it's by a designer that they appreciate or respect so i think it can have a massive impact on who plays the game and how the game gets played so um yeah i guess that's maybe how it can be bad I think, yeah, going back to the opposite side of what you said, I think that makes absolute sense. Just make sure you have the vision and think about the accessibility. And I think not just about the readability, what you said about having tiny text, but also with the text. Um, I know I said I wouldn't review Discover Your Assets, but I just want to say this kind of... I mean, I like the little people who've re read my rules will know that I appreciate little bits of flavor, but it says the challenge player may defend that set of assets by showing you either a matching card or a wild card from their hand. A smirkier smirk or an even sweeter smile accompanies this move quite nicely. Now, I don't mind that text. What I mind is the fact that it's in exactly the same font in exactly yeah. as the main rules. Now, I just think that when you look at these rules, this is meant to be a simple game. This it, this took me way more energy to read than it should have. I'm just saying. Like, there's one, one, like, illustration of what's going on, and then it's like, sorry, all these pages, although this technically is just advertising bump. So, like, you know, it, you know, all that plus that. It just, and it's just the same, okay, you've got headers, and I'm not going to say, yes, you do have inset things. Thank goodness they did that. But they don't use, like, um, it just feels like they could have box out um, for things. Oh, remember this? or And we do have this technology of having different treatments, make sure that it's readable, that it communicates things clearly. Doing things like in Magic the Gathering where um, they had um, flavor text in italics and then they realized, hey, wait a minute, this isn't even enough. We need, because people are getting a bit confused, mm. we need to communicate this even more clearly. So they had a little pin line that looks like two swords almost. I don't know if you've seen that on the newer cards. I've not, no, but that sounds sounds like a good idea. I mean, I think anything like that is, um, you know, that's, uh, as a graphic designer, uh, that sort of thing really speaks to me because I think, you know, layout is so, in it's so interesting. You know, again, you can go into the psychology of how people read and why people read things, but, you know, that amount of text that um, you've got in cover your assets, uh, is that what it's called? Um, yeah. Um, if that was broken out, in a different way perhaps that would be a bit more digestible and perhaps mm. maybe more people would play the game you know there might be people that have bounced off it because of that so um i think it's um it's a really interesting one and you know as a graphic designer i would always advocate that people invest time and money into good graphic design but unfortunately i think it's a lot of the time it gets relegated to the bottom of the pile um in terms of game artwork because you know, beautiful min sculpt miniatures and beautiful painted kind of illustration is often what sells a game. And then the graphic design is there in the game to help you play it. But by that point, people have bought it. So does it really matter? Um, so, yeah, I think it does get left behind a little bit sometimes. I mean, I am I know this is not a review of their game. And I'm just going to... I feel like no, I shouldn't 
just mm, let me not okay I'm not going to say what I was going to let's let me stick on topic um so one thing I've learned through graphic through game design is that everyone thinks and learns differently and um yes just as game design is about what rules are easy to learn graphic design and especially rule books are a separate matter I mean that's a completely separate topic and um yeah yeah anyway um i feel like i want to sorry i'm just kind of being distracted by this thing i want to talk about but i'm aware that i probably shouldn't um anyway so let's go into tips so if someone is looking to get into graphic design let's say um me i'm here okay and okay, I've done it a couple of times in the past, but how would you um, tell me to, whether it's someone who's just starting up, um, thinking about self-publishing their first thing, or whether it's me doing my um, in a bind, in a bind junior, in a bind expansions, Wibble, Wibble, plus plus flux, um, Kitty Cataclysm, seventh thing. Okay, so whether it's someone doing their first thing or me doing my seventh thing, um, what tips would you have? And maybe that could be slightly separate bits. Um, I think looking, just looking at lots of different graphic design examples, I think um, out, so outside of tabletop games as well, you know, look at um, when you read a magazine, how, how you feel about a, a block of text, how it's, how it's presented to you. Um, you know, oftentimes, like I think, like publications are, are a great example because, um, you know, you might start reading an article which is a long, a lot of text, and it's presented to you in a way where you feel like you want to start reading it. You know, whether it's they use like a big um, stand first, which is the opening paragraph of the article, just big, and so you read that, and then you're like, that's interesting. I want to read a bit more. So I think looking at lots of different examples, um, you know, there was. A, graphic design is there's a lot of fundamentals that you know we're all kind of standing on anyone that does graphic design now is standing on the shoulders of the giants that that worked mm. it all out before and things like um the hierarchy of text and and layout of text and things like that you can learn from just looking at at anything i mean everyone you know well uh, most people have access to written material whether it's books or magazines or food packaging or whatever it is and I think just looking at all examples of that and thinking what is it about this that makes me want to look at it what is it about this that makes me want to read it and then transposing that into how it might work in game design because I think a lot of um you know a lot of the time it's easy to look at other game examples so you might look at another game manual and be like oh how have they done this game manual but I think taking a step back and thinking what is the information that I need to present um, and how can I present that? And looking at a broad spectrum of things, I think can be really useful. Um, and you know, graphic design again, it's something that which you you need to learn. And there are people who are innately good at it, but it's I think it's an it's not an it's not an easy thing to learn. But there, there's some straightforward things. There are principles that you can follow, which maybe is not necessarily is you know something like um, painting or drawing. Um, is a bit harder maybe to get into. I think graphic design, if you're interested in it, there's not I mean, examples out there. Because it's a bit more technical and it's a bit more of a science. I don't know if you've seen um, an article called "Do UX of Lego Interface." Yeah, I did, I did see that. Yeah, yeah. And um, so this is a very. If you go to my Twitter, twitter.com/slash/tofabez. It's, I shared it just this morning, and um, or it's designed by cave.co.uk 2020 LEGO Interface UX. But um, it's a nice article which basically goes into um, the different types of accessibility features you can have, differentiating things not only by size and shape and color, but by texture or motion or grouping things by function or grouping things by um, the thing that they control or and all these different ideas and there's a lot of information there 
that can be translated to board game design and yeah. how are when you design a little panel how are you going to for your role and write if you design a bit of paper how are you going to design this and where do people normally go and so there is definitely a lot of reading and speaking of which finishing off the tips if you could give some recommended reading for people who really want to get into this do you have a few websites or a book or two that you could recommend to um i guess it depends on what element of 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 graphic design um there's a um a website called um uh, under consideration um well it's under consideration and brand new is the is the website or the the feature underneath that um so if you just google under consideration i think you get a link for brand new and that's basically reviews of um critical reviews of of company rebrands and visual identities um and it that's really interesting because it's just good to see i mean i think some of the, sometimes it's overly critical and people weigh in the comments with their own thoughts um and obviously we don't know how it was how it got to that place but it's interesting to see how see new stuff that might be very on trend or you know might be um yeah just how that how that's talked about and how that's broken down um and i think book wise it's a very very dry thing to look at um but there's a book called grid systems by joseph muller brockman which is a um a book about how to use grids and i think if you're ever doing any kind of layout of text whether that's a cv or a an article or a um a game rule book um having an understanding of how to use text layout i think is really really important you know because there are lots of there's lots of different things you can learn which i think will that will help in that process you know how sorry is that grid systems by joseph miller brockman that's correct yeah um which i'm not even sure if that's um if that book is available anymore but if I not mean, i could buy it for 35 pounds 20 so it's not the cheapest book no anymore. it might be it might be out of print but i think anything um i mean there's lots of different re as you were saying there's lots of different resources on the on the internet for the science of graphic design and um you know how we how we process information which i think is really really useful i think just being really open-minded and looking in lots of different places and not just looking at game design not just looking at game manuals or game boxes looking much wider and then trying to apply that to whatever it is that you're trying to do um i think is is really useful mm. i love the notion of looking out with what we are making if you're not so mean because you know a lot, i know lots of people have said it's about video games that there's a lot of people making video games who only play video games which means that it can start to be a bit um uninspired and that's all these video games whilst might just be um they don't bring anything new to the table because these people don't um add anything new if you know what i mean yeah um, i i mean while i've got you here i know um so i was thinking so my company logo i started off saying bye bears mm -hmm. and then because i was like yeah what am i going to call it it's okay i'm going to just be making stuff by me i'm going to call it bye bears and then it got to ah here in a bind junior because i was like yeah a lot of people started calling it who's this by and then for the company name they just put bears because i was like okay i see what's gone wrong and someone who actually puts it by by bears in their review i was like okay i didn't mean to be that that wasn't me being willfully um obtuse i mean it's fine if you are willfully obtuse but you know you want to know when you are being obtuse if you're not mean it so yeah. like stuff by bears at least it's a little bit easier but when i've got that that's just um a bit of text i don't really have a logo and with the this one where which is the wibble plus plus deluxe 
you can see what's happened on there. I've tried to show, hey, this is a system that I believe it is by everyone, and I want to invite everyone to be part of it. But so Sarah Kennington made the point to me that I really need more red. It, I need to have some sort of logo that's got some red in it because that's meant to be my branding. Mm. And in this day and age of digital marketing where I can't just go to a convention and have 20 people playing in a bind and because of the noise they make and sites, then other people are going to join in. That's not possible in this day and age. So I've realized that, OK, this is something that is super important. And I know this is really cheeky of me, but um, what's your professional opinion? Do I, do, do I need like a picture-y style logo if you're not to mean something more? Um, Should I, I have some red? I don't, I, well, for me, I think, you know, when you have, um, and I know this is not what, what it is, but when you have a logo which is a signature or um, uh, handwriting, um, hmm. Well, it's just handwriting. I literally yeah. hand wrote it. Yeah, but it's a. It's like, I think it speaks to the idea that there is a. This is something that's crafted. You know, it's come from um, a singular place, and I think you don't want to. I don't think you want to lose that. Maybe I'm. Maybe I'm um, being presumptuous, but I would have thought that you want people to know that um, whilst it's been. Whilst it's a product that's come from lots of people, it's it's come from you. You know, the idea is stemmed from you. And I think having a handwriting style logo is a great way of communicating that. Um, if you had something that was very polished and worked up, I don't know. It, to me, it feels like that would be incongruous with what 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 you do. Um, so that would be my take on it: is is to keep to keep it as it is. Um, and yeah. I don't know. Yeah, I, I guess you iterate mm. with every game that you make, but I think um, that's that's you know that your handwriting is as recognisable as if that was a shape or a logo or whatever it is, whatever you want to call it, a, a graphical mark. Um, it's still a recognisable thing that I think people that are familiar with your games will see and 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 understand. Yeah. I mean. You're right. I mean, there is that balance of wanting to say, yes, this is a personal thing. OK, I'm just going to say what I wasn't going to say about cover your assets, because um, they spend, um, you know, half a page telling us about Grandpa Beck and their family and how they play games. And it's nice, but I kind of feel like they're milking it a bit. I mean, me, me. This feels like very unfair words, and I'm aware that this is going to be live for posterity. But it's like when they say, "Yeah, without the marketing department, we rely on you to spread the word of our games," and it's yeah. I mean, it's difficult, isn't it? Because. Um... I think m most people that self-publish games don't have a marketing department. I think most people that self-publish games don't have big budgets, um, which is why I, you know, it's why it's difficult talking about things like art direction and having a singular vision. Mm. Ultimately, that's something which costs mm. it costs money because if you want to hire someone to oversee that, or if you want to hire a professional graphic designer and a professional artist and a professional sculptor to to build your game, it all costs money. But I think Thank you for raising that, and I do want to acknowledge that point because so often I hear podcasts from people who work for multi-million companies and it is so out of touch with people who are kind of struggling to get their first thing made. For some people it's just, okay, I want to get my thing on a shelf. For some people it's like, okay, I want to potentially turn this into a career but I'm not going to have any money for this. And if you look within the UK, where the UK's got quite a few sales of games going on, but within the hobbyist board game space, like how many companies are actually big enough to have any sorts of, to have even, yeah, a person on a payroll who's working full time 
I mean, mm -hmm. even with that, like that's a really low barrier for a company. But to actually have a person on a payroll who's working full time within the hobbyist board game space, okay, you've got Alley Cat, ITV, Modifius, Games Workshop. Anyone else? Um, Osprey, Osprey in the UK. Oh, yeah. Osprey, yep, yeah, that's true. Um, and within the RPG space, there's probably a couple. But like most people, um, if you hire someone part time, it's going to be more budget than you are actually bringing in. Um, yeah. I think it's difficult, but then I also think, you know, there's within the hobbyist space, there are lots of tools that can be lent on, like Board Game Geek and um, you know, like Facebook groups and. Um, things like we're doing today, which, um, you know, if you're, um, I guess if you're someone who's self-publishing, you can you can leverage these tools, but it does take a lot of effort and a lot of time and a lot of dedication. And so I guess, you know, putting something in your rule book saying, we rely on you to spread the word. Well, I think, it, you know, as a, cre as a creator, um, you know, you need to be putting in, it's, it's kind of about as much as what you give out I, I think it's a bit unrealistic to to release a game and then expect the game to do well based on other people talking about it. Because if it's just you involved in it, you've got to put in a lot of time and effort into getting it out there. And that's what you know I was saying earlier about making a game is a long, hard process. And anything you can do to help keep yourself engaged and motivated and driven is, um, I think, is really important to to find those things. I mean, having said that, at all like I. I absolutely agree with what they are saying. I mean, it just, um, it does apply to basically everyone. And um, frankly, even if you do look at places that do have employees like Inside the Box or Alley Cat Games or Osprey, they're not big companies. I mean, frankly, no one in the hobbyist game space is. And so when people do spread the word or play it with other people, of course that helps a lot. And of course, mm -hmm. um, you know, I like to believe that when people are talking about the games for the L deck or when people are playing them with other people, some of the people might be motivated to grab their own copy at some points down the line. And that is like the dream that your game does become a slow thing and Tim Fowers you know talks about this very slow viral nature of board games which I think is 100% true that if a game is good people will naturally talk about it um, and yeah, yeah and I, so I, but I think I think it's um you almost you can ask people to do that but I think people will people will only do it if they really believe in the game I think it's almost saying to people if you like my game tell people about it I think we we do that naturally i think you know like particularly in the hobbyist board game sphere people mm. love talking about games that they enjoy i'm not sure i'm not sure you need to tell people to do that i think people do that naturally um it's just i guess giving those people platforms and the space to do it um that's the the real trick yeah i mean it feels like once again we've started tumbling down the marketing rabbit hole yeah. because that's yeah how all of this stuff has a thing to it but you know everyone does have limitations and barriers there is a financial barrier there is a time barrier there is a skill barrier like not everyone is going to be able to internalize all this knowledge and it's a lot to think about all at once to think about the accessibility to think about what draws the eye to think about the tone that you're setting to think about everything all at once. Yeah. And that's why, yes, if you have a company that's big enough that it can spend a millions of quid on a single game, not just the marketing, but actually, you know, in the case of Wizards of the Coast, where you've got, you know, a massive team of people working on Magic the Gathering, yes, they are going to be doing incredible work. And I do have a lot of respect for them. 
And when you are able to get even a smaller team working on something like, um, yeah, frankly, seize the power, I like to believe is going to be better as a result of myself and his working with inside the box. I mean, sure, there's in theory, nothing to our doing that we couldn't have done ourselves. Like we could have painted everything, made everything. and But having someone else looking at it, helping to develop it, being like the community manager, having someone else doing the marketing, having someone else do all these different bits. Um, and it's easy to all oh, marketing that's evil. Can it, you know, everything kind of leads into making a game world that people will care about and making an overall good experience. And I think that's why, yes, as long as you've got what, for me, um, if we go to, um, like, let me, I, I'm actually going to pop this slightly further ahead. So recap, it feels like what we've kept talking about is um, like having a singular vision, being like, this is what the game's all about and everything needs to match that vision. And yes, you need to have that, but within that, people can have their own parts that are paying extra special attention to, or even just a second set of eyes. Yeah, absolutely. I think I guess that would be the. Uh, it's a great way to recap what we were talking about. But uh, for, like, yeah, it's just what. Um, just I think like I I guess more so than focusing on art or mechanics is just finding something which you're interested in and using that as the leverage to to develop the game, to build a game, to 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 keep driving yourself forward. And if you can. Um, it's a great point. If you can get other people involved who might be able to help with those other things, um, then then great. But I think having someone having someone on uh, like an umbrella over the top and making sure that everything is is working within a vision or you know a def defined parameters, I think is really important for making a a finished thing which feels coherent and cohesive. Mm. Yeah, I love that. Now I. Jumping ahead, I want to say thank you to everyone who's been um, following along. A special thanks to those people who said hello in the chat. Thank you to Xate, to Alan Outson, to Dina, um, to Alex. And I think, yeah, I want to say thank you. Most importantly, um, to the person that I have beside me, Rory Muldoon. Oh, thanks very much for having me on. It's been great to talk about something that I'm very interested in, and uh, yeah, and love people listen. It's really good. It's been lovely. And um, if people would like to find you, where can they go? Uh, so I'm most active on Twitter, and my uh, Twitter handle is Wookiebait, which is W O O K I E B A I T. Um, I am on Instagram as Roll Them Bones and Facebook as Roll Them Bones as well. Um, and my website is rorymuldoon.com if you want to see some kind of finished stuff. And posted all that into the chat. And if you would like to follow me, then I am Stuff by Bez. Well, you can go to stuffbybez.com now. But I realized that I really, really need to improve that website because I had it up and I was like, what's even here? It's just a set of links. Do you know what I mean? And there's no content. There's no blog. It's, yeah, it feels a bit rubbish, frankly. I do need to sort that out. But if you want to buy my stuff, you can go to stuffbybez.bigcartel.com as it's going across there. Um, on Twitter, I am quite active. I post every day, not just about this show, but also about daily highlights and sometimes about things that are going on. Instagram.com slash softbez, I share pictures. Twitch.tv slash softbez is the best place to um, watch these live streams. Facebook.com slash things by bez, there's a few groups. And softbez at gmail.com if you just wish to get in touch. And looking forward to hopes and ambitions it's over to you for this final section so i would like to ask people what are they looking forward to i have not um officially announced it because i've 
been quite bad at um, putting things online recently because of energy levels. But I am looking forward to having um, Chris and Layla on in a wee bit. They should be arriving literally in the next couple of minutes. And um, we are going to be playing some L games together. And that is a thing that I'm doing. And then I'm hoping that, you know, I'm going to... Yeah, I'm also looking forward to eating some more of the food that was cooked yesterday because I feel like we cooked a good amount of food for the double how many people we had. It's... Yeah. How about yourself, Rory? And if anyone in the comments wants to contribute, please do so. Um, I'm looking forward to... I'm going to see my cousin on Wednesday. I'm going to stay with him and his family for a couple of days. And I haven't seen him for months now. So I'm really looking forward to that, which will be a nice few days off work as well. Um, yeah, so that's the main thing I'm looking forward to at the moment. And... Um... Just to clarify, whilst Sates or other people um, type in there, looking forward to our hopes or ambitions. So it is the live stream of some of the entries. I'm going to start um, in reverse order, if you know what I mean. So I'm going to start from the latest one and then go back to the first one, just because um, that seems like a sensible way to do it. So also I've got a few more rules questions with some of the later ones that were submitted. So, um, yeah, that does. And I am going to ask that on this stream, um, no one shared exactly which day ones they made. But what during the L competition entry stream, I've not got a good name for it. Maybe L design, L, ga L deck game design stream. I don't know. I feel like it, I should try to think of something that's fewer than like six words. I'm struggling with this, so if you've got any ideas. But um, yeah, that's what Ksates is looking forward to. So um, as always, if you enjoy this, and please share, spread the word. I'm going to be back tomorrow. I'm going to be doing a review with Alan Paul of Energy Empire. We are going to be reviewing this game because um, we've both played it a few times, possibly Alan more than me, and... We will discuss it and see what conclusions we come up with. And yeah, then, but today, as I said, starting around 1 p.m. ish, I don't want to set a definite time because I'm doing it mainly as, okay, this is something we've got to do for work anyway. We might as well stream it. I'm not streaming it with the main priority of, um, yeah, do you know what I mean? But, oh, playable. Playtesting L submissions. I like that. What do you think, Corey? Should I use that name? Well, I think playable is good. I like that, yeah. Yeah. That, or that maybe works. testable. Oh, yeah, yeah. Test. Oh, I'm trying to work out if test would be a bigger word or a smaller word than play. Because L's a pretty short letter. I think they're both... I mean, testable says exactly what we're doing, as as in we are testing them. So, yeah, I'm going to, um, with your permission, hopefully, Xates, I kind of think we're of that agreement that hopefully that's the thing that you're happy for me to use. I'm going to say testable playtesting L submissions. Oh, I forgot, speaking of feedback, I forgot to give thanks to all the Board Game Geek users um, whose photographs I used. I made sure to use the ones that's copying are allowed. And um, apparently I own Xate. Um I'm just going to ignore the second parts of that comment. <laughs> but um, yeah, thank you everyone. The next streams are today at 1 p.m. ish, tomorrow, which is going to be now called Testable playtesting some L game submissions. Then tomorrow I'm going to be with Alan Paul. And Wednesday, oh my God, I'm so excited about Wednesday. I'm going to be chatting to Ella Loves Board Games, if you know them. And, oh yeah, and Tuesday night, I'm going to be doing some stuff. And Tuesday afternoon, might be drawing some stuff. Well, I really need to get this all up on the schedule so people can see it. And then Thursday morning, I'm chatting to Colvin about writing. 
and chatting to about writing for Fantasy Flight games specifically, given Colvin's big new projects. Then, but yeah, the drawing is going to be tomorrow afternoon as well, and then having some prize games. And then Friday, I'm excited about that as well, where I'm going to be chatting with Mark about Tabletopia. And then, yeah, honestly, like someone not you asked me um, how I'm feeling about this. And honestly, like, I look at these. And then Saturday, I'm, like, talking to a Japanese illustrator. Like, they've got to have um, a translator who they've arranged to have. It's basically their husband, because their husband speaks better English than them, I think. Okay. But I'm super excited. They've done some amazing work. And then on Sunday, I'm having, like, a three-person thing with Digisprite. So that's going to be exciting. And... I'm just super excited to chat to all these people, and yeah, it keeps me going. I feel like I benefited so much from having you on, and I know we've already done the thank you and everything, but it's been so lovely. Okay. I wish that we could just, um, you know, have a great day together at some point in the future. Just like, you know, when all this is over, let's... Um, meet at some place and just sit down and do some stuff and just chat for like a full day or something by a nice body of water yes yeah. exactly of course there is only one thing that we have to do at this point and that one thing left is to say bye 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 this is a goodbye song bye 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 thank you for watching along bye 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 bye. This is the end of the show. Bye bye. Bye bye. But now it's time to go. Mm -hmm. Bye bye. Bye bye. This is a goodbye song. Bye bye. <laughs> bye bye. Thank you for watching along. Bye bye. Bye bye. This is the end of the show. Bye bye. Bye bye, and now it's time to go. Bye bye.